As we get into today's episode, I just want to take a second and remind you that there's a ton of extra content available to the members of Film and Whiskey Nation who support us through our Patreon. Check us out on patreon.com slash filmwhiskey. On today's Film and Whiskey, we are scoring out the films by director Billy Wilder, and we're doing that while drinking two whiskeys from Virginia Distillery Company. Then we're going over to an interview with our friend Marcus Choi, who plays George Washington in Hamilton. That's all ahead on The The Film Film and Whiskey Whiskey Podcast. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome into the Film and Whiskey Podcast. I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And we're coming at you with another special bonus episode. Mm, bonus episode. Feels nice to be doing a bonus again, Brad. Mm, that's right. It does, Bob. <laughs> now, as you all know, since our loyal listeners are surely tuning into this episode, we're structuring our podcast season around many series of films by particular directors, and we've just finished out our series by the director Billy Wilder. He of classic Hollywood fame, Brad. We watched three movies by Billy this season, Sunset Boulevard, Stalag 17, and Sabrina, and we are going to be measuring how good of a director this guy Billy is anyway. Meh. Based on some metrics that we developed. Brad, you want to fill the listeners in on uh, how we're scoring out <laughs> Billy Wilder? We will be scoring him out based on he his ability to direct actors, so the performances that he draws out of them, uh, the cinematography, how well he presents the picture to you on the screen, uh, the editing, which includes the transitions from scene to scene, as well as the sound design for the movie. The cohesion, how well does the movie flow together? Does it feel disjointed at parts? Does it feel like like a a whole story unit that makes sense together? And finally, uh, how unique do these three movies make Billy Wilder, uh, mostly among his peers, but Mm -hmm. also, you know, in the history of cinema, how how well does he stand out? What does he bring to the table that other directors don't? Exactly. Is he a, a singular voice? In oh, the history of cinema. A singular voice, a singular vision. Billy Come Wilder. Come on down to the Wilder side. <laughs> that was a pretty nice Clint Eastwood you had going on there. Thanks, man. I was going to say, we've only done this so far with one other director, and that was Clint Eastwood to kick off the season, uh, who fared pretty well. You know, Clint Eastwood is a darn good director, and I don't think he gets enough credit for how good of a director <laughs> darn, he is. Darn tootin' darn good director tootin there. Darn good director. So we shall see how uh, Billy Wilder does in our metric. And we're going to kick things off talking about the performances in these three films. Now, again, just as a reminder, when we do these little exercises here, we're not looking at any other films in this director's filmography. You know, Brad and I have talked about Double Indemnity and The Apartment and Some Like It Hot in prior seasons. But we're pretending that if we were just figuring out how good a director is, it would be solely on the films that we looked at for this miniseries. So, Bro, I'm not going to lie, though. If we were basing this off of Double Indemnity, Some Like It Hot, and uh, uh, the, what apartment. Was the third one, and The Apartment. Tens across he, the board, man. He might score higher than Scorsese and Spielberg. Yep. Yeah, tens across like, the board. <laughs> yeah, that would be incredible. All right, let's talk about the performances in these movies. I think, Brad, that for the most part, they're quite good. Um, I think my big issue is with a couple people in Stalag 17 and with overall the character of Joe Gillis in Sunset Boulevard. However, I don't think that's a bad performance. So I'm I'm kind of waffling here. I think I want to give him a nine out of 10 because for the most part, the actors pretty much knock it out of the park. Yeah, I mean, it's hard because Joe Gillis wins William Holden a Oscar in Stalag 17. So it you know it's hard it's hard to turn down a role that gets you an Oscar for a movie that you didn't deserve an Oscar for. <laughs> that's that's a pretty impressive feat. <laughs> All right, so uh, yeah, I'll give him a nine on performances, Brad. Where are you coming out on performances? Uh, I think I'm actually with you. I, I think that for the most part, he just creates really unique characters and finds 
really great actors to go along with it. So yeah, I think nine out of 10 is good. All right. That takes us to cinematography. Now, again, when we go through some of these categories, obviously we know that Billy Wilder is not the cinematographer on any of these movies. However, like most people in positions of authority, the buck stops with him. So the way his movies look is largely up to him and the way that he communicates his vision to his cinematographers. Billy yeah. Wilder has never really been known as the most artistic director when it comes to the way his films look. And Brad, I didn't really get to talk about this during the episode, but I think that Sabrina might be the Wilder film that has the most attention calling to itself <laughs> camera work mm. that I've ever seen in a Billy Wilder film. There was a lot of really good wonders in that movie. There were a lot of establishing shots that would be like, you know, panning up to look at the top of a skyscraper or like the camera movements were much more pronounced than they usually are. And I feel like in most Billy Wilder films, it's kind of just like a static camera and there's not a lot of movement of the camera. So yeah. it was interesting. I think we had kind of a variety of approaches and especially with Sabrina, I thought he really used the camera very, very well in that movie. I'll give him an eight and a half here. Yeah, I, I think in Sabrina, he definitely shines in this category. It feels like he did a really great job early in the film before she goes to France of establishing that she is small and young using the camera. And when she gets back, the camera can't leave her like she is the center of attention. And so I think he uses that as a device to show her growth and how um, William Holden's character and Humphrey Bogart's character you know, their attention is not on her at the start and boom, it, like she is the center of attention from halfway on. Mm -hmm. So I think he does a really good job with that. I'll give him an eight out of 10. There, there's there's nothing spectacular here, but there's enough that he's doing well to say like he, he is very solid. OK, so the next two categories are ones that always kind of bleed into each other. We're going to talk about the editing of the films and then the cohesion or the cohesiveness of those films. I think I'm going to give him a higher score on editing than I am on cohesion, Brad. But I, I could really go either way. Do you know what I mean? I think with a movie like Sunset Boulevard, uh, it doesn't hang together perfectly for me, but he does a really good job of establishing mood and atmosphere. And I think that's done with editing. On the flip side, yeah. I think that Stalag 17 is a movie that could have used more editing. It's like a really shaggy movie. Uh, and it also does a good job at establishing mood. But I think, honestly, if I was going to score that movie out, I would probably call that movie more cohesive than well edited, whereas Sunset mm -hmm. Boulevard is the opposite. So I'm I'm kind of struggling with a score here. Well, and remember that that sound plays into editing as well. Mm -hmm. So if you're if you're thinking about the 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 scores for the films and um, I, I think I'm with you for the most part, I'll give him an eight and a half on editing. I think that for the most part, he he uses the movement from scene to scene really well to establish what's happening. I think that in Stalag 17 especially, he does a really great job of, of calling attention to certain things and moving the action along when he needs to. The only problem with the editing is I, I'm with you. There are certain scenes that just draw out a little too long. But I, I think for the most part, he is a a really solid, uh, deserves a really solid score here. Yeah, Brad, I think I'm with you. I'll give him an eight and a half on editing. And then when it comes to cohesion, how would you score him there? That's an interesting one. I Honestly, I think this might be his weakest category. I think that in all three films, there are just certain story beats that he either misses or lingers too long on. There are there's moments where I feel a little bit confused as to what's happening, especially in Sunset Boulevard. I think I'm going to give him a seven and a half here. Hmm. Yeah, I'm going to do the same. And I'm with you on the Sunset Boulevard. I'm like, it really bums me out to give Sunset Boulevard such low scores, especially since it's such a highly regarded movie. But of the three... I think it did work the least for me at what it was trying to accomplish. Again, mm -hmm. I still think it's probably a better movie than Stalag 17, but Stalag 17 wasn't aiming so high. Do you know, do you know what I'm saying? Yes. I yeah. think the thing that redeems it here in terms of his score in this category is that I think Sabrina is a perfect movie and that thing yeah. holds together beautifully. 
So yeah, I'm in the same place you are. I'm at a seven and a half on cohesion. Man, I am like looking at our last category, uniqueness. Once again, I maybe I'm trying my hardest to only evaluate these three films, but there's part of me that's like, I don't want to give Wilder a low score here, but compared to his other films and the impact that those have had on my cinematic taste, these three don't hit the same way, man. Mm-hmm. Sabrina does. I still love Sabrina. But Stalag 17 doesn't feel markedly unique for me in the world of cinema. And I, I, I mean, if I'm being honest, I think Sunset Boulevard would have to be the most unique. Yeah. I don't know. I, t- t- talk to me. I, I'm not sure where I'm, I'm falling here. Yeah, I think it's hard to separate out what we know about Wilder outside of these three films. But I am still going to give him a 10 here. And it really comes down to his writing. I mean, he's just one of the best screenwriters of all time. No one really writes like him. I think if we were going to get really nitpicky about it, we talked about the similarities between Sunset Boulevard and All About Eve. So I think if you wanted to say like, oh, well, you know, Joseph L. Mankiewicz was writing just like him at the same time, you could probably make that argument. But I just when when we talk about the one liners in a movie like Sabrina, no one could Mm -hmm. do it like that. He had such a wit and it was such a biting wit that very few people had at the time. So even on just these three films, I don't know that his peers were making movies like this. I'm going to give him a 10 out of 10. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, dude, because if you really think about it, like Mankiewicz was writing things like All About Eve at the same time. So you could probably use that as a strike against uh, Sunset Boulevard. I don't know if you thought about that. No, no. that, That thought is just dawning on me right now. Yeah, I, I I know you're glad you brought me along you, on this podcast. You've been Bob. dwelling on that one for a while, haven't I, you? I I really have. I this is this is going to get dark for a second. Are you ready, Bob? Oh my gosh, I guess. Yeah. I I think one of the reasons I was going to give him an eight and a half on uniqueness, but I think I'm actually going to give him a nine and a half. And I think it's because, like, as I as I think about the movies he writes. He's the only director I think I've ever seen with a willingness to dive into the territory of self-harm and suicide. Hmm. And I, like, I don't know of any directors, I definitely don't know of any directors back then that were really willing to take on that subject. So I, I think that that alone makes him a very unique director uh, and his willingness to take on a, a topic that has had a wild amount of social taboo in, in the religious world of the 50s and 60s. Boy, I tell you what, you sure know how to send us out on a positive note, Brad, don't you? You got it, man. <laughs> no, I'm with you, dude. I, I really do think that there is there is a level of uniqueness just in terms of the subject matter that he's willing to broach. And so, yeah, I'm coming out to a 43 and a half out of 50. Brad, what are you coming out to? I am at a 42.5. So not not too far off from you, Bob. No, that brings us out to an average of a 43 out of 50 or an 86 out of 100. Again, like I think Billy Wilder is a much higher score in general than an 86 out of 100. But even on three films that we kind of varied wildly in our enjoyment of, it says a lot about the guy that he's coming out to an 86 here. Yeah. Yeah, I think, once again, I truly think if we had his other three movies that we've watched on the podcast here, he'd be at like a 48 out of 50. Yeah, he he would be approaching a perfect score, for sure. Yeah, like, Billy Wilder is truly one of the greatest directors of all time. If there's, I think if there's anything to do here, Bob, it would be to blame you for picking these three movies. Yeah, that's always what we should do in instances like this, Brad. You know, I will, I will say this, before we go over to our whiskeys, You've now seen six movies by Billy Wilder for this podcast. If Mm -hmm. someone was asking you for a starting point with Wilder, where would you send them first? Uh, Double Indemnity and Some Like It Hot. I like that. Yeah, I think I would also go with Double Indemnity. And then if you want to go the lighter route, go Some Like It Hot. I don't think you start. Maybe Sabrina. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, I probably prefer Sabrina. I don't think you start with The Apartment. And that's actually my favorite Billy Wilder movie, I think, still to this day. But you have to get a knack for the way that he balances comedy and tragedy before you can Mm -hmm. really appreciate just how perfect of a movie The Apartment is. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I, I think the apartment was our second one that we did with him. Uh, I think no, it was our third. We did double indemnity and some like it hot mm-hmm, first. Mm-hmm. So maybe I should have had it p- pinned down by then. But I think I was a little cooler on the apartment than you were. Well, we're gonna go back and watch it at some point because it's too good Dude, to just leave on the I, shelf, man. I am excited to go back to it because yeah, I, I think that when you're looking at a director like Wilder, when you start to understand a the world he came out of. In, you know, Eastern Europe, 30s and 40s. And you start to understand how that shaped his sense of humor. It deepens his films in a in a really important way. And I, I just, yeah, Wilder is just an incredible director, Bob. Well, Brad, we've got two whiskeys to drink from Virginia Distillery Company and their VHW line. So what do you say we get over to those before we throw over to our friend Marcus Choi and in our interview with him? Let's get to it. All right. So today we are trying two more whiskeys from Virginia Distillery Company. If you listened to our last bonus episode where we scored out Clint Eastwood, we tried four whiskeys from this distillery that they bottle under their Courage and Conviction line. And today we're drinking two whiskeys from their VHW line, which is a line of finished whiskeys that are partially their own distillate. Uh, It's single malt whiskey distilled here in the United States that is also blended with scotch whiskey. So we've got, uh, you know, international whiskey represented here, Brad. And then they finish them in, you know, various different things. There's a uh, there's one that they call Brewer's Batch whiskey that's finished in beer casks. And then there's also a Chardonnay cask finish as well. But today we're looking at a port finished one and a cider finished one. These are both clocking in at 92 proof. We can share a little bit more information about each one as we go. But Brad, neither of us have tried these off air. So we're both sipping these live. Yeah, this is a rarity for me, but my life has been, fun fact, very busy. (laughs) All right. Which one do you want to start with, man? Uh, Let's drink the cider first. I I feel like there'd be a lot deeper notes on the port that might drown out our experience with the cider. So I like it. Yeah. So according to their website... Uh, This cider cask finished whiskey is, again, made from 100% malted barley. So they finished this in cider casks that are primarily sourced from Virginia cideries. And it says that they leave them in there for an additional 8 to 20 months. So again, they're blending a a bunch of different finished barrels together. Some of them aging longer, some of them not so much. I am very excited because, fun fact about me, I really like hard cider, Brad. Dude, uh, my parents were in town the other weekend, and my dad has recently gone gluten-free, so he's not drinking beer, and he got, he loves Stella Artois, Stella Artois makes a cider, Mm. and it's incredible. Interesting. I mean, like, one of the best ciders I've ever had in my life. Wow. So, if you are interested in ciders that are not (laughs) Angry Orchard Sweet... Go get yourself some Stella Artois cider. I can't believe we just gave them that much free promotion on our podcast. So th- <laughs> thanks for that, Brad. Yeah, I just, I just said their name like four times in, <laughs> in the span of 60 seconds. Let's get back to the whiskey we're actually reviewing right now, which is the VHW <laughs> cider cask. Brad, as I knows this, I will say the immediate thing that stands out to me is that this doesn't necessarily smell like a 100% malted barley whiskey. The cider no. influence is really strong here. It makes for this really nice prickly and and quite frankly, like apple cider heavy nose that almost brings it back around into like a bourbon or a rye kind of nose. Oh, I don't agree with you there that it smells like a bourbon or a rye. Uh, for me, it almost dives into white wine territory. Interesting. I, I think that the mixture of American and Scotch single malts mixed with cider it gives it some really interesting floral notes uh it it, it gets a little bit astringent for me mm. um i don't have not, that at all yeah not in like a crazy way i th- but i'm with you it it does smell like a really tart green apple peel mm-hmm. it has some of those notes that we often get on like irish whiskey there is a brightness to it and mm-hmm. i just took a sip man i got to say uh, this is dangerously good, Brad. Like it, it has all the characteristics we like in a kind of uh, like char ash forward single malt whiskey. 
but it also has that insane drinkability of a hard cider that gives Mm. it a, a crispness all the way across the palate. It mellows out any rough edges on this, and it provides like a really, really nice, I would say mouth watering finish, which is not something that I expected to get on this. I could keep sipping on this for like hours, man. Yeah, I, I think for me, the barley comes across strong at the start, which mm-hmm. I wasn't expecting based on the nose. But once you get through that barley heavy front palate, yeah, it turns into like it feels like you're drinking apple cider, but it's a lot hotter than, than apple cider. Mm-hmm. And for me, some of those like floral notes come through. There's a little bit of vanilla sweetness at the back of my palate. And then you're right. It is very crisp and tart throughout on your tongue. I think that this is solid. I I don't know if I would say that it's like something I would want to drink all the time. I am really digging this. In fact, I think, you know, if I'm if I'm thinking back as hard as I can to the four that we tried last time, only one of those really stood out to me. And I really, really liked that one. I would put this right up there. Like this is probably of the five that we've tried now. This is probably either my favorite or my second favorite offering from this distillery so far. Yeah, it is. I will say it is very unique uh, and it is very flavorful. I just don't know if it's hitting my palate quite right. I'm struggling a little bit with the flavors that they are marrying here. Well, I think then that we should switch over into this port finished one because this is definitely going to be more up your alley. This is, you know, finishing in port casks is almost as common anymore as finishing in sherry casks. It's a flavor profile that I think we're going to be really used to, especially as much as we've camped out in, you know, the Glen Morangies of the world. So again, this is a port finished whiskey, 92 proof. The port casks that it is finished in, it sits in for a minimum of 12 months. So we should have quite a bit of port influence on this one. Brad, as you know it, what are you picking up on the nose? Yeah, this one once again comes through. If there's anything I know about uh, Virginia Distillering Co. now, it's that their their whiskey has a unique nose. Mm. I don't know if it's their terroir, but like I think if I drank this a few more times, I'd be able to pick them out of a blind nine times out of ten. Because even on this one, it is a lot deeper. The color is gorgeous on this. Like this might be the platonic color you you want whiskey <laughs> to look like but yeah the nose is really beautiful it gets into almost like a dark black cherry territory mm-hmm. there's a carameliness to this there's a little bit of honey but underlying all of that is that strong barley flavor yep. that i've been getting on all of the virginia products yeah and i will say that it doesn't smell young a lot of times with craft whiskeys, we can smell the youth and the kind of grain forwardness. You know, for me, this one, honestly, Brad, is probably the most ethanol heavy one on the nose that I've had so far. Um, the ethanol really jumps out to me on this one. But underneath that, I do get all these notes that you're talking about. Lots of dark stone fruit, like, a, you know, like a cherry, like a plum. I'm really excited to try this one because it does have those kind of caramel notes you were talking about. Uh, I'm going to give it a sip. I can tell you've already been sipping on it. What are your thoughts, Brad? Yeah, this is their best whiskey, like far and away. For me, the the initial burst of plum and cherry mixed with like a dark chocolate on Mm -hmm. the back end of my palate that it almost felt like I was drinking a really nice light roast coffee. I this this is incredible, Bob. Yeah, see, this is the funny thing. I love it when you and I try like exactly two whiskeys and one of them is our favorite and we're on opposite sides of it because that means that the next time I see you, I get to say, hey, give me the rest of that sample of the cider finish and (laughs) I'll bring you the port finish. I Mm -hmm. I totally get where you're coming from. And as soon as I drank this, I was like, oh, this is the Brad G flavor wheelhouse. But for me, the last time we drank their products, I talked about this, too. The char heaviness on this almost kind of comes across as like a cigarette ash for me. It's like a really, really bitter char. And I think the flavors on this one kind of accentuate the char. So if you want something that feels like you almost have to chew on it, you know what I mean? Like you sit down Mm -hmm. after eating a steak and you want a cigar and you want a whiskey that's like mimicking the experience of smoking that cigar. This is the one for you. This is like really robust and it'll put some hair on your chest. You know what I'm saying? The other one is much more like, I just got done mowing my lawn, and I want something that's not a bourbon, 
but that has the crispness and the lightness that will refresh me on a hot summer day. And so I think my favorite one was definitely the cider finish. And it sounds like the port finished was definitely yours. Yeah. Yeah. This port finish is really incredible. And I, I think that this just goes to show that they over at the Virginia Distilling Company, they are just experimenting and trying really unique finishes. Bob, I don't know if we've ever had a cider cask finished whiskey before. I don't think we have. And I've only, I'm only familiar with a couple distilleries that are really doing it. I think more should be. You're going to be hard pressed to find a better one than this Virginia Distillery Company. I'm yeah. super, super satisfied with this overall flight of six whiskeys we had. I can't thank them enough for sending them our way. Yeah, hundred percent. The the stuff that they are putting out is fascinating. And if if you are like us and you've drank a lot of different whiskeys in the last four or five years of the whiskey boom, go try this stuff out because there's not a lot of American single malts out there. If you're looking to experience something new and fun and interesting and delicious, then th- these whiskeys are should be right up your alley. All right, Brad, it's time for us to get over to our interview with Marcus Choi, who plays George Washington in the traveling tour of Hamilton. I'm excited for this one, Brad. What do you say? Yeah, let's get to it, man. I'm, I'm really pumped for this. All right, everybody, we are joined by Marcus Choi, who is currently touring with Hamilton in the Philip tour as George Washington. Marcus, how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me, you guys. Oh, man, I'm so excited to talk to you. Listen, we had uh, your former castmate Jared Dixon on a couple months ago, and uh, in in they the wake got of Dixon now, <laughs> yeah, right, exactly, yeah. In in yeah. the wake of that, we were like, we got to get more Hamilton people on the show. The spike in listenership was drastic. <laughs> so, was really? Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> no, like seriously, I you know you hear about how diehard like the Hamill fans are, and then oh, yeah. you see it like quantified in your downloads, and it's like, okay, you know. At that point, Jared hadn't even announced that he was going to Broadway, and he, he kind of told us off air, and we weren't allowed to disclose it. And so, uh, you know, just for somebody that's in, like, the touring company, yeah. it was, like, the response was insane on, like, it's it's got to be incredible, just as a member of the Hamilton family, Marcus, to see the level of support that you get from the community. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, it, and, it, and now it's it's a global brand. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, Mm -hmm. you know, musical theater is just becoming so popular in Asia, South South America and Europe. And, you know, it's it's exploding everywhere. And so Hamilton is just kind of like this. It's kind of like leading the way now, you know what I mean? Because, um, you know, it's an intersection of so many things that people enjoy, like hip hop and uh, rap and uh, musical theater and history and you know, just kind of like American his American culture and history, and mm-hmm. and, uh, and 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 the the fanatics uh, that follow and support the show, it it runs deep. Yeah, I opened up Spotify yesterday, and it was like new for you. The German language version of the <laughs> yeah. Hamilton soundtrack just dropped. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they they should, they should recorded an, an album. I'm like, oh my god, that's incredible. Listen, if they need a ringer for anyone in a different language version of the stage production are you mm. are you able to tap in for anybody uh it's certainly not german <laughs> uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe if they record a korean album i don't know you know i'll, I'll do my best <laughs> i love that yeah so marcus uh just to give a little bit of a bio on marcus he has appeared on broadway in shows like flower drum song wicked which i think you were in the original cast on wicked right yeah both of those shows yeah, yeah that's incredible uh sweet charity Allegiance, Miss Saigon, and then he's had over 60 credits listed on his IMDb in both film and TV. I've got a couple that I want to pick out just from those because it's like some of my favorite TV shows and movies. But Marcus, we're going to kind of like throw it way back to the beginning. So having been on stage and on screen, why don't we start off by talking about like what are the primary differences of, of having to flip the switch between, you know, projecting to the back row and then being able to be subtle enough for a close up when you're on camera. Sure. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, I think hi- historically when it comes to theater, um, you know, the idea of like having to project is it's, it's not necessarily there anymore because we're all mic'd. Right. Right. And um, so that, that, that affords us the opportunity to 
kind of lean into more intimate moments and, and not have to, you know, project if you're having a sensitive, quiet moment, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, but, but certainly on stage, you know, you have to play to that last rail up in the balcony. So th- life is certainly bigger. Um, gestures and actions could be bigger, you know? Um, and, and when it comes to, uh, like TV and film and a- acting in film and TV and for the camera and acting on stage, it's funny. I always say that it's basically the same muscle, hmm. but you're just, it's just a different technique. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Or is it like, <laughs> you know, I, I, I imagined like the old uh, poster for, do you remember the Arnold Schwarzenegger documentary? Like what's it called? Pumping Iron or whatever. And it's just like, oh, yeah, bicep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like I just, I kind of yeah. wonder if it's like the difference between being on stage at the bodybuilding where you're like in your little speedo and having to flex as hard as you can versus like, uh-uh. yeah, I've got these muscles, but I don't have to show them off in this way. You know I mean? Right, 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 right. right. Yeah. I like to imagine Arnold just walks around California in his little speedo. Just in a speedo. Sure. Fle- flexing <laughs> constantly. Oh, you know he did in Muscle Beach down in Venice all the time. Oh, of course. All he did. The time. <laughs> yeah. Just, just messing with dudes. <laughs> But it's funny, you know, like, uh, you know, there's always that rule of like, oh, on camera, things are much smaller. You know, you just play, you you just, you you don't have to be as big, but. Unless you're Adam Driver in Marriage Story. (laughs) (laughs) But like my, my example, there was Jim Carrey, you know, like Jim Carrey is larger than life and, and so amazing at his crap at being big, you know, and, and certainly his dramatic work, it, it speaks for itself as well, but. You know, those rules don't always apply, I think. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, and I think whatever is specific in, uh, to, to you as an artist and whatever works for you is, is uh, you know, what you can capitalize on, you know. Yeah. That totally. works. You totally, know what I mean? totally, man. So, well, and yeah. like to your point, too, I'm looking through your IMDb credits and, you know, way back towards the beginning of, of some of your first on-screen stuff, it says that you were a dancer in the movie Enchanted. Which oh yeah 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 Brad and I are noted Amy Adams fans so please oh, like, if, if you have anything horrible to say about uh, her I don't want to know but like, no 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 <laughs> she is deli- I love Amy Adams and I have to admit like I was I was a huge fan of hers um like even when when we first started shooting and like I was just super excited to be on set with her and at that time I I had uh, I had just finished doing Wicked with Adina mm. so. Like it was, it was like this weird situation where like I was a dancer in the movie, but like because I knew one of the stars, I was hanging out with her and oh, like the sure. other stars. So like I was at crappy with like James Mars Day and like Amy Adams. I'm like, yeah, blah, 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 blah. You know, this but, is like, you know, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. You no, know, no, there was like this one moment where I was just, where I was just like, you know, where I, I, I started up conversation with Amy and I was just like, you know, do you live in New York? Blah, blah, blah. She's like, no, I'm just visiting your work. And, and like, I wanted to shoot my shot so bad. and be like, if you need anybody, <laughs> but I did it. I, did. I, I kept it respectful and professional. <laughs> that's, that's probably the way to go in retrospect. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. 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 Right. Or you could be married to Amy Adams right now. That's true. I mean, Which these are, these are the two extremes that you, but you have. But <laughs> <You're right. laughs> You know what? I wasn't planning on asking a question like this, but you bring up James Marsden and I know he's got a new TV show out right now called Jury Duty, which is like really pulling in fantastic reviews. And uh-huh. I want to ask about like a James Marsden in the year 2023, because, okay. you know, I'm watching like I, I'm a huge fan of the classic MGM musicals and like your Gene Kelly's. Mm-hmm. And it just seemed like we had, you know, back in the day when the studios were pumping these movies out. There were these yeah. specialists that were the best singers, the best dancers that had movie star looks and could act. And, every, you know, there was like a quadruple yeah. threat. Yeah. And I feel yeah. like those actors are so few and far between now. You know, you've got a couple that can make the transition like a James Marsden or a Hugh Jackman or, you know, what Hugh have Jackman, you. Yeah. But like, what do you think it is about the current Hollywood system that when we do a musical, it's like, no, we, we don't want like a Hugh Jackman for this. We want a Ryan Gosling so that we can do like a more grounded La La Land thing. Like, do you sure. feel like we undervalue the triple threats now? Oh, wow. That's a great question. Um, uh, there, there might be, I think maybe like 
entertainment might be going through some sort of renaissance where where they're they're being valued again or or they're they're being utilized as triple threats mm. and just because the movie musicals become such a thing right um like the uh like the live action of cartoons is becoming such a thing mm-hmm. um so i feel like uh, they are being utilized more but and um, certainly with with like the last i would say the last you know 30 40 years um you know it, it that that like golden era of movie musicals definitely went away. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, like if you if you think of somebody like like uh, Hugh Jackman, you know, it's like he literally like if God were to be like, I'm going to create the perfect man, and just like <laughs> shot down lightning, and all of a sudden from the earth be the perfect man that could do everything, it's Hugh Jackman. You right. know what I mean? Right. Like it's it's just <laughs> not there. Well, like, you know, we, we did uh we did a season on the podcast where we picked movies kind of from like growing up that we wanted to revisit that we weren't sure were great. And it was a uh-huh. really fun season. And one of the movies that I picked was a movie from way back in 2011 called Young Adult. It's like a, a dramedy with Charlize Theron. And, and one of the actors in it is Patrick Wilson. And I had yes, no idea probably, until yeah. like a year ago that Patrick Wilson uh, angelic voice. Like I, I just happened to be browsing Spotify on like a show tunes thing. I had no idea that he did a revival of Brigadoon. And you know, it's just, it's so funny because it seems like he has to live these two separate lives, which is like Broadway yeah. musical star and then serious Hollywood actor. And they, they don't overlap at all. You know what I think it is too, is because like I call, I call like Broadway shows or just, you know, the, the theater schedule blue collar entertainment. Mm. because um, the schedule is relentless, you know, eight shows a week. And for us being on tour, you know, five show weekends, it's just exhausting. Right. And when you, I think as actors, you know, a lot of, a lot of actors get their start from the stage, but um, when you, when you reach a certain level and you're able to break that threshold into TV and film, um, you know, that's the goal for everybody. Right. And, and I think, once you once you reach that point, you don't have to hone your theater skills or you don't have to dance or take dance class or voice lessons anymore because you're like a serious TV actor or screen actor. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so I think that kind of lends itself to what you're talking about as far as the, you know, um, kind of like this disappearance of the triple threat, you know, uh, because a- actors didn't really have to hone those skills anymore. Yeah, you, you don't know have to mean? sing. You don't have to sing for your food anymore. You can just exactly. act for it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. And because well, there's so much content now, like more and more people are breaking through without having a lot of like any training. You know yeah. what I mean? You're you're hearing about people being discovered all the time, or just like new people popping up. And although they might have taken you know you know a conservatory class here, or you know acting classes, or dance classes, or whatever. Um, you know, it's not like, you know, going the traditional route and getting your MFA or your BFA to this, you know, school and, and you, you know, and like going to like, you know, London to like study theater. Right, you, you don't right. necessarily have to go that route anymore because there's just so many, so many avenues now. Mm-hmm. That's man, that's fascinating. It, the way you were talking about it, it has me almost thinking about like football throughout the world mm-hmm. and how you know in Europe and in South America they have all of these youth organizations set up to basically scout out who's going to make it mm-hmm. in the world of football and who's not and it it seems to me like in the world of acting and stuff there there used to be a similar system that you were talking about of like theater and yeah. stage and and you have sure. these schools and conservatories but now yeah. like I don't know. Do you think that it's getting a little watered down as, you know, as as streamers are looking for 80 new shows to, to yeah. start in the next month? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think both things can be true. I also feel like there are so many kids shows now that once you become a child actor, you're already in the public eye. Yeah. So so networks and studios have to work less to promote you as you get older. Mm-hmm. you know what i mean so it's just like these children actors they're just like they're just jumping from like 
Nickelodeon show to a Disney show. And then all of a sudden they're like on a Netflix show that's being produced by A24. <laughs> and then before you know it, they're adults. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Sitting, sitting courtside at a liquor game, you know? <laughs> exactly. <crazy. Yeah. laughs> all right. Well, we, we've gotten like way off the, uh, the Hamilton track. And I was kind of curious with being a part of a traveling group, you know, you're spending mm-hmm. a week here, two or three weeks there. Like, what are the challenges of traveling so much for work? But then also, like, what do you love about it? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, the challenges, I would just say, is just, like, packing up, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, certainly after after the lockdown ended, I had just accumulated so much stuff that, uh, like, like, I drive the tour also. I got my own car and oh wow, just pack, packing everything up. And then putting in the car, getting to the next city and unpacking everything. That's probably the biggest challenge because, you know, I have my kitchen staff. I got, I, I love cooking. So like I have like my knives and my, you know, pots and pans and, you know, utensils and stuff. And uh, I'm a sneaker head. So I got a lot of shoes and I travel with, you know, and, you know, I just like, you know, at, at this point in my life, I'm like, there are certain things that I just don't want to have to uh, live Go about right, and um, yeah, and or, or just like settle on, you know. And so, um, the packing certainly is probably the biggest challenge. But I, I love, uh, I love tra- uh, tra- traveling and and being able to, do, you know, go to these new cities and experience them um, through through the show uh, mm-hmm. because, you know, it's just like. America is so big, you know, and and I grew up in California and I lived in New York. And, you know, al- although those places are great, there are so many other places that I just I, I never got a chance to experience. And um, and so being able to travel for work uh, and eat at all the uh, different restaurants and like, you know, experience what like this city is unique for. And and like e- like even here, like this is our second time in Appleton. Right. And Appleton is a tiny little town. Mm-hmm. But there is this restaurant that I always go to. Uh, that I went to the first time we were here. It's called Basil Cafe. And it's a shout out to Larry over at Basil Cafe because it's a Vietnamese, a Viet Thai restaurant and they make some of the most incredible food. I was just talking to my girlfriend the other day. We went out to lunch and I was just saying like this restaurant would be successful anywhere in the country. Yeah. Like it's, wow. it's, it's that good, but like it's in tiny little Appleton. And so like, you know, it's that kind of stuff that I love about being able to travel. I was going to say, I know that you're speaking Bob's language because he and his wife did a, a road trip for their honeymoon around the country and nice. made sure they found the best burger place in every state. <laughs> nice. Do you go to, uh, do you go to uh, Minneapolis and try the Juicy Lucy? Okay, so listen, this is a point of contention with me and my wife yeah. because <laughs> we t- so you know we live in the Cleveland area. We took yeah. 90 all the way from Cleveland to Seattle. And, uh, wow. and so this Juicy Lucy was about an hour off the beaten path. And my okay, wife was okay. so, this was like, this was only like day three or four of the honeymoon. And she was like, I don't want a burger anymore. <laughs> like, like, give me a day to recover from burgers and then we'll start again. So I missed that one. But we had a Juicy Lucy. There's like a steakhouse in Seattle that we got a Juicy Lucy at. That was, okay. it all was right. pretty darn good. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. I, when we were in Minneapolis, I think it was diners driving the dives. It was an episode where where uh, Guy Fieri went to uh, like Minneapolis, and they're like two restaurants that yeah. say they started the, the Juicy Lucy. Yep, yep. And and uh, my my boy Conroe, Pandora Brooks, uh, and I, he was with the show before. I was like, dude, we we have to go. So the the one was in this tiny little bar. It was like the diviest of bars, but they have a little grill. Oh, I forgot what it was called, but it was oh, it was so good. If you have a chance to go to Minneapolis, definitely find the bar. I, I'll I'll send you the information. Oh, please do. You, this is, you got, you this gotta, is why you I brought you it. on, like low key. I just wanted food <laughs> recommendations. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> you know, that's actually a great segue though, because your Instagram, which is where we first connected. You know, uh, we did yeah. this episode with Jared, and and you mm-hmm. were super kind, giving us a shout out. And um, then I started checking out your Instagram, and I was like, this man knows food. This man knows drinks. And <laughs> and I know you've got a, you guys on the Hamilton tour have a great relationship with uh, Nelson's Greenbrier. 
and we've had their uh, products yeah, on the show pretty. before. Yeah, they are great. So I've got to ask you, having been to all these tiny little towns and and yeah. cities across America that you normally wouldn't have been able to go to, mm-hmm. like which ones immediately jump to front of mind when I talk about food cities? And I don't mean like, OK, like, of course, New York and L.A., right, because they just have sure, everything. Sure, sure. Right. But like like hidden gems or just for the size of the city, I, I was blown yeah. away by the food atmosphere here. Well, certainly Seattle, mm-hmm. Portland. Yeah. Um, you know what? Let, let me let it marinate. I was going to say, I can feel you like flipping through yeah. the, the book in your mind. Yeah, I, I'm just trying like, but, but it, more than like a city, there's like that, that has like incredible food across the board. There's like restaurants that mm. like come and in different places, like yeah. in um, Memphis, the original, uh, oh, what's that? What's that fried chicken place? Gus's Gus's fried chicken. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Had Gus's. Yep. And the, the original, the original one was right around the corner from from the theater. Like that was incredible. Tulsa, Oklahoma. There oh. is this tiny, this tiny little steakhouse in the back in this back alley called Bull in the Alley. Amazing drinks, amazing steaks, like <laughs> that, that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? <laughs> Bull in the Alley. Bull in the Alley. <laughs> I'm Billy, a very big fan of that. Billy had incredible, like low key, incredible food. Um, I know a lot. A lot of people are always like, "Oh, Billy cheese, Billy cheese," and yeah, they do have it. But there's just, I mean, it's just so diverse there that yeah. like they have yeah. so many like great authentic restaurants. I I lived in Philly for a year, and there's a restaurant okay. on the north side of town called Tierra Colombiana uh-huh. that has it's like Colombian and Cuban food oh. that is easily they have the best flan I've ever had. Oh. everything there was incredible. So, dude, nice. I am with you. Philly is an incredible food city. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I will, I will have you both know that, like, the cardinal rule of having a podcast is no free promo. And we have given, like, 58 <laughs> restaurants the best. <laughs> I'm going to be invoicing all these places, right? <laughs> but honestly, it's like, like, I just have love for all of them because – you know, whenever we go, they're just like, they'll take care of us. You know, sometimes they find out that we're there with the show and they just, they take care of us. Yeah, and so yeah. like, I got nothing but love for all these places. Absolutely. All right. Let's talk a little bit more about the show before we get into movies here. So yeah, yeah. you are, I, I believe I read this in an interview you gave that you are the first Asian American man to play George Washington in Hamilton. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah still the only one. Wow. I mean, just yeah. like, let's just stop there for a second. What is the significance of that for you? Not just playing this iconic theater character, but also who that character represents in American history. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. Yeah, I, I, it's um, kind of, you know, like it's an honor and responsibility to like always kind of do my best and like carry that torch. Mm-hmm. Um, for for just like the optics of of Asian Americans in entertainment, you know, like when I was when I was growing up, like Miss Saigon was the show, right? And when I was in high school and you know into musical theater, just getting started, you know, my my parents were skeptical of me going into the business, you know, they because like as immigrant uh, parents, they just they want their kids to be happy and successful, right? Like any parent. Mm -hmm. Um, But as immigrants, they just, they have no idea what the entertainment business is like, you know? And, and so I think there was a lot of fear around supporting me, making the choice to go into acting because they didn't know how to support me in it, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And, and so like when, when Miss Saigon came around, and I saw it in high school. That was the first time where I was like, there's a place for me in this business, you know, uh, at the highest level as far as musicals go, because I was just like all about musicals growing up. And years and years and years later, now that this, like Hamilton is my first tour and being able to do this, this role in this show on tour is giving an opportunity to all those little Marcuses across the country that never thought that there was a place for them, you know, hope and the, the, the strength to know that like there is a place, you know, and that if there was any kind of hesitation to 
squash it and and follow your passion because certainly you know it, it's it's sounds so trivial to say but like if i can do it you can do it mm-hmm. you know and and like i feel like it's a responsibility that i think that's another reason why i've been with the show for such a long time like i feel like it's a, a like a bit of a responsibility to like continue that yeah as we go to new cities you know yeah that's yeah, incredible I'm, I mean, in a lot of ways, like when you talk about best president, it's either George or Abraham, right? Right, right. Those are the those are the two. Right. And I'd say George Washington is probably the top fa- most famous U.S. Shit. person ever. Sure, like, sure, yeah. Like, and so I'm curious, like, as you've played this part over the years and and done research for the role, like, is there anything you've learned about George Washington in your time playing him that like a lot of people wouldn't know about him? Um, yeah, there are a couple of things. But do like just in doing my my research for the part, I just I I I think the reason why he was successful during the Revolutionary War was because he had learned from so many of his losses during the French and Indian War. Um, mm. he was younger then. He was a younger officer that just like he basically got his butt kicked a bunch of times. Um, but back then, rules of engagement were when the like the captain or the general of whatever troop that had lost was captured, they would they would be returned without you know being harmed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think you know when it came to um, you know war and fighting and 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 um, you know kind of operating on that level, I think he was he was successful because of all the things that he learned. And it, the, a thing that was, that was kind of crazy was like, he was almost considered like, he was like a deity yeah, because of so mm-hmm. many crazy things that happened during battle. Like he was always on his horse. He was always in the fight. And when they would, you know, the fight would end, he would, his jacket would be riddled with bullet holes, but he wouldn't, he, he didn't have any, he, he never got shot. That's crazy. It's insane. <laughs> it's insane. You know, but like, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, you know, it's like that, it, that also lends itself to his belief in God and, and, and how that might have like, kind of like made the, um, like the lore Mm. Of or the mystique of, you know, George Washington grow even more because maybe you know people thought that he was touched by God sure. or, you know, you know, in in that sense because he was just like he he never died in battle, you know, and then you know to to end up leading the country um, with such integrity, you know, and and he was don't get me wrong, he wasn't perfect, you know, mm-hmm. like at that time they were all, you know, it's the great American sin, right? They were all right. slave owners and and. um uh, but I know that he did a lot of things to try to improve the life of his slaves. He tried to connect family members with different slave owners um, mm. as as like, you know, as like his slaves would get older and older. And But certainly to to have the foresight of relinquishing, you know, the office um, after after serving a term. You know, in that selfless act, because yep. he could have easily been the king of America, easily. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and and um, in just that act alone, you know, really, I think that's that's probably the main reason why he was so beloved. You know, um, in setting up the country that way. Yeah. All right, let's go ahead and pivot to movies here. Like, I want to get you talking about movies a little bit before we let you yeah. go today. And, you know, we we planned this out for an early May release, not realizing at the time, uh, at least I didn't realize at the time, but May is Asian American May. Pacific yeah. Islander yeah. Heritage Month. And then I was like, oh, my gosh, like, you know, I saw you posting. A, you, you've been a, a pretty vocal advocate for AAPI issues on your Instagram. Yeah. And I said, yeah. man, let's get you talking about this a little bit. And I sure. think... You know, if I can speak freely here, we have had a lot more diversity in the voices that are being uh, presented and can come to the table in Hollywood in the last five, 10 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is still like a huge void in Asian American 
voices in Hollywood in particular. Sure. And and yeah. Yeah. I had initially floated to you the idea of like, let's do a top five AAPI movies. And then I, you know, I'm just start Googling like, because I had my list of five and I'm like, well, what are the other ones? And then there was like only five movies. Like <laughs> if you're yeah. not going to bring up every movie that's like a martial arts related movie ever, you know, right. everyone talks about the Joy Luck Club, you know, and, and right. since last year, everyone talks about everything everywhere all at once. And sure, I think that the first place I'd like to go with this is just to acknowledge that while we all have our favorite movies in this category, it is one of the most underserved and underutilized populations in terms of having diverse voices represented. Yeah, no, I don't I completely agree. With that said, I, I reached back out to you and I was like, Marcus, what are we going to talk about here? And you were like, dude, I got this. I want to talk about my favorite movie star of all time. Uh, why don't you introduce us to the topic at hand today? I would love to talk to you guys about my childhood hero, Mr. Bruce Lee himself. Yeah, that's right. Uh, he, yeah, when we, we started the tour in Seattle and uh, I made it a point to, you know, go visit his burial you know, pay my respects because man, Bruce Lee was everything when we were growing up, everything. Like I was, uh, like I, I'm 45. I was born in 77. So I would spend every Saturday morning watching Kung Fu theater, black belt theater, you know, the dead, you know, Shaw brothers, Kung Fu movies every week. Mm -hmm. And Bruce Lee was one of those guys that just, he was like a real life superhero. Yeah. You know, and it just made me feel like to see myself, you know, on TV, even though, you know, even though he was speaking Chinese and it was dubbed, like I understood that like, oh, like he, there's, there's a, a significant amount of, you know, traction that this man has created through martial arts and then getting, oh, as, as I was getting older and just getting into his life um, and more and more, just understanding that, you know, his journey was so remarkable and crazy that he passed away at such an early age. Yeah. Well, it's I was going to ask about that. Like having that element of it folded in, to your experience with Bruce Lee, because, you know, his most famous movie is released in America as Enter the Dragon. And I didn't even realize this until today. It comes out like a month after he died. And that in, in a lot mm -hmm. of ways was like many Americans introduction to the guy. And here he is like he's he's not with us anymore. And so in a lot mm -hmm. of ways, you know, his legend grows the way a James Dean would have, which is he makes three sure. movies and then he's gone. And it's it's yeah. so obviously gone too soon. But for you growing up watching his movies, but also knowing that he was dead at that point, like yeah. what, what does that do for the legend of Bruce Lee for you as a kid? Oh, it, he just, it becomes like, he just becomes otherworldly, right? Like he's like, in my mind, he's like the biggest thing mm -hmm. because there's no, there's no decline. He He's locked in time as yeah. this, ripped, <laughs> you know, incredibly strong, quick, fierce Asian man mm -hmm. that was able to like destroy people with his hands, like take on like, like in the, um, you know, fist of fury. Yeah. Like he takes on a whole school of, of like, uh, <laughs> like karate fight, like a whole karate school. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. And like, did you, did you remember that scene where he's like running the rickshaw and he's in disguise? Oh, yeah. And, and, and like he lifts the rickshaw and like throws it and like yeah. that kind of stuff, you know? And I know it's all movie magic and, and it's laughable kind of now, but like back then as a kid, just knowing what technology was, like it was incredible to me. You can see his influence though still to this day. Like, Oh, RRR yeah. R hits theaters last year, and it's it's this this Bollywood masterpiece, and it comes to America, and I'm watching it, and I'm going, oh yeah, scenes where he's taking on you know a thousand human beings at once, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. that's Bruce Lee, like yeah. <laughs> like right there, you can see the through line. Well, you know, it, it's he was he was the person who ushered in martial arts movies into America. Mm -hmm. There would be no Jackie Chan. There would be no Jet Li. You know, there would be no. There wouldn't be these guys if Bruce Lee didn't 
kind of like open up that door, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah, man. He was, it was just like, I, I would like every time I would watch a movie, I would like tie a couple of sticks together and just be screaming, doing my nunchucks around the house, jumping off the tables, like fighting with my brother. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was all about it, man. Yeah. You know, you know, flexing it and like screaming in the mirror. <laughs> well, then let, let me ask this as like my my closing question on Bruce Lee. How personally offended and hurt were you that Quentin Tarantino had him just get his shit wrecked by Brad Pitt in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? You know, it, it's funny. Um, the guy who played the uh, the actor who played uh, Bruce Lee is a, is a buddy of mine. Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah, shout out to Mike Mo. You know, he's great, great actor and and martial artists I, honestly i i didn't mind it yeah i understood that tarantino had his point of view on it mm-hmm. and and the movie wasn't about bruce lee right the movie right. was about the stuntman man that happened to be around the same time and you know like i i was entertained by the scene i thought it was i thought it was fun you know and and i can see how people would would get upset at that but at the same time it's like it's just a movie right Right. (laughs) and and i can't like like you got to pick and choose your battles right like i'm not gonna i'm not gonna fall on that sword a hundred percent you know i wasn't trying to lead you into a trap there i'm just i I, I, I totally don't think i don't i I don't think you did and like i think that's kind of like the thing with with the comedy now right like whereas 10 years ago you Comedians could do and say whatever they wanted and say, it's comedy. Right. Well, they can't do that anymore, right. you know? Well, and um, like, to your point, so, too, I think one of the great things about Bruce Lee is that he was willing to get his ass kicked on screen. Like, you you knew he would come back at the end. Yeah. You know, one of his yeah. most famous scenes is, like, when he's fighting Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and, like, Kareem leaves yeah. a gigantic footprint on his chest because yes. he's seven feet tall. <laughs> and, <laughs> Game you know, of like, death. Right. I read every I feel like every week now about these action stars that have it built into their contracts now that they cannot lose a fight in a movie. And it's like, uh, you know, yeah. just just for the sake of the narrative, like seeing your guy get beat and then have to rise again to win the ultimate victory is so much more compelling. And so I'm with you, man. Yeah, I don't think I don't think Bruce Lee would have even minded seeing Bruce Lee depicted that way because it's yeah. super consistent yeah. with what he did on screen. Well, sure, I mean, sure. That like feels like the American way. Like we we talked earlier, George Washington became a great general because he sucked at it earlier in his yeah. career. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? Like like we all hero. go through struggles. It's the hero's journey. One hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, before we go, uh, I know this is called filming with whiskey, and yeah. we didn't even talk about whiskey yet. Just really quick, do it. Uh, I just wanted I just wanted to talk about one of my favorite whiskeys. Uh, Japanese whiskeys oh, because it's API it, month. Yes. <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm totally a bourbon guy, but um, if you guys haven't had a chance to try the Fukano. Oh, no, we have not. The Fukano, F U K A N O, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a whiskey, but it's, uh, they added rice to okay. the distilling process. And, um, and, they, and then, you know, like I just, I love Japanese whiskeys. Um, I'm not a huge single malt fan, mm-hmm. but when it comes to like just whiskey in general, like the Japanese really know how to do it well. This whiskey in in particular, they uh, they age it in sherry barrels, and I know that it's you know it's, that's a really popular thing to do now. But it was one of the first ones uh, that I tried, and it is it's incredible. The Fukano, if you get a chance to try it, absolutely try it. I- I was gonna say we we don't hunt a lot, but I'm looking at this right now. Uh, Bob, put it on, put it at the top of the hunting list. No, <laughs> yeah, we'll do, we, man. we need to get ourselves some the Fukano. Well, how about we just yeah. do this, we'll, Marcus? Next time yeah. we do a Bruce Lee movie or okay. anything related that you would like to come back on and join us for, we'll sit down, we'll talk about a movie, and we'll drink some Fukano. What do you say? I, I like it. All Let's right, do man. it. I tr- I travel I travel with a bag. <laughs> That's how much I love it. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, this has been Marcus Choi. He is currently on tour with the Hamilton Phillip tour as George Washington. I am seriously so honored you sat down with us. Thank you again for joining us today, Marcus. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, you guys. 
We'll be back again on Tuesday with another regularly scheduled episode. But until then, I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And we'll see you next time.